Hey guys, so I have Christopher uh, Brantlin on my channel today. Uh, hey Chris, how's it going today? Uh, pretty well. A long yeah. day yesterday with, uh, I think I told you, I had a nine hour kind of uh, venture with the evidentiary hearing and coming back late. So I had, a, with everything I had, a, like probably a 14 hour day yesterday. So I'm a little out of it, but it's all right. Um, I'm still energized and I'm happy to help out. And uh, I'm very honored to be on your podcast, buddy. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so sort of know Chris as, as the carnivore lawyer. I actually caught him on Anthony Chafee's channel. And um, I really sort of resonated with his story. Uh, you know, he uh, was really into bodybuilding. You actually won some competitions, I think, or you're, you're a runner up. Yeah, so, no, I was actually Mr. Los Angeles 2010. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I, you That's probably can, you could probably show the video. There's a little photo on it later if you want to kind of modify this, the one I sent you earlier. But yeah, yeah I will. I was I'll... actually. Yeah, I was actually uh, very competitive during law school because, long story short, uh, I, was a, I was a personal trainer all throughout college and law school, but throughout college, I was also a fraternity president. So even though I trained hard, I partied hard. So I was more of a power lifter, but once I got into law school, I wanted to take everything very disciplined. So I stopped drinking. Uh, I actually stopped smoking weed because, well, that'll be honest, it'll still coming back to me, but I smoked a lot of weed in college. And I basically just ran my own personal training business. I paid for my own law school because the training business did well. I didn't have any social life. I, I basically discommunicated with most of my friends. And I, all I did was I trained uh, myself. I trained my clients and I studied. And I did that. And on the weekends, I would either go uh, rock climbing or I'd do some kind of long runs or, uh, or uh, bike rides because that's why I did uh, triathlons. Mm -hmm. But I was started competing and I studied under a, um, a dietitian who works uh, very well with um, uh, a lot of uh, all natural bodybuilders. Yeah. It looks like you found the photo. There we um, go. Yeah. So ripped, um, absolutely ripped. It's yeah. Great. But you know what? Everybody's best. like, Oh, you look so big. I was like, actually I was about 154 pounds. It's not too much heavier than what I have now, now, but it was just, it was just a very, what I did is it wasn't zero carb, but it was carb cycling back then. So I had a good, really, a really good di uh, registered dietitian, Chuck Rudolph, who's still a good friend of mine. He wrote a lot of books, but he kind of focused on natural bodybuilding. But you know what? Right now, he's leaning more towards the carnivore side. So because he's like, you know what? You really don't need carbs. You know, you're just going to go if you can really hit a good ketogenic basis. And he loves grass fed meats. He actually moved out uh, uh, out of California. And funny enough, he's over in Tennessee as well. Yeah. Uh, but but anyways um yeah that's what i did and after i passed the bar exam i was still staying in shape but i had some issues and i may have probably you probably saw this from my video with chafee is that um uh in about 2015 or 2016 i just started waking up with some really weird pains and i was just feeling very jaggy and tired and i did the worst thing and most of it was kind of like gut issues i think some things could have sparked that bad environments, you know, instead of having a stress as a personal trainer, as you may know, there's two types of stress. Um, there's you stress and distress. Okay. You stress is good stress on the body. You know what? Even though I was training all day long, I loved what I was doing when I was practicing law. Um, no, you're taking a lot of stress that you don't like. And that's why the attorneys have the highest suicide rates is we deal with the, probably the worst problems you can imagine, you know, uh, and I think that was part of it, but also I started having alcohol again because, you know, I was going to all these like, you know, happy, uh, happy hours with the other attorneys in LA. And anyways, um, I started having these gut problems and I did the worst thing you could possibly do is I went to a, a medical doctor to help, help me out. And this <laughs> I is, say, I thought you were going to say plant-based. <laughs> no, you know what? That was part of it when I was trying to see detox and I, I yeah. actually tried, a, a vegan diet. I didn't even last like a, like a couple of weeks or a month. It felt horrible. Uh, completely destroyed my gut. But anyways, the long and I never really went to the doctors. I always kind of was in, I was a competitive wrestler during high school. Um, and my high school usually has national champions and I didn't, it wasn't a national champ or state champion, but I did fairly well. Uh, then when I got into college, you know, I was always, always a personal trainer. I always kind of took care of myself and even in law school. So I never really went to the doctors. Uh, and then when I finally went to the doctor, you know, I started off with the GI doctor and that's where things went wrong. And I shouldn't have listened to my family because they said, you know, well, you're the health nut. Why are you having problems? Well, just go to the doctor. 
And when I went to the doctor, that's where a lot of the problems started happening is because um, he started giving me, well, you got some SIBO, well, you probably got some small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Let's see how we can manage that. And they started giving me a lot of pharmaceuticals and that's where things started going wrong. 2015, 2016, was, you know, it was either like, you know, um, antibiotics, uh, laxatives, and corticosteroids, a lot of other stuff. And I, I told the doctor, I was like, it's not just my gut, it's all over. I knew something was going on with me, but eventually it got so bad where my intestines were so inflamed. And I do blame a lot of the doctors for contributing with, because I was taking so many pills to try to help me out, but then it ended up destroying my gut. So in 2017, a part of my sigmoid, the end of my intestine was getting very inflamed and it was in so much pain. So I went to a, a GI surgeon. He said, I think if we remove this one piece, Mr. Bramlin, you're going to feel so much better. I think this is the problem. And I can guarantee this is, you're going to feel amazing. And you know what? And this is where a lot of people go wrong is when you're in pain and you're desperate you're, you're willing to kind of like believe anything. So that's where I said, fine. So in 2017, went in for a partial colectomy and that's where things got worse. So first of all, um, you may have heard this from the other videos. They, I, I, I'm not sure if they gave me the proper anesthesia, but I actually woke up right after they cut my intestines where they're kind of still kind of sewing me up. So I woke up and I screamed in pain because I woke up too early from the anesthesia. You're supposed to be out for a couple hours. I woke up right after they cut up my test in. So, Oh my God. I woke up and I just started screaming and they actually had to like get all the nurses and you heard all the lights go on and like, and they basically had to give me some morphine and a bunch of drugs to put me to sleep. Then, um, you know, I, I was still felt a lot of restriction because everything was so tight because they had to cut me open. I was barely able to move. And then they're like, okay, we're going to release you. I'm like, it's, it's only been, well, it's two days and I haven't moved my bowel. Shouldn't I kind of make sure everything's working there, doc? You said I'd be feeling a lot better. I'm a little worried. He's like, no. And all the nurses are like, no, you're, you're fine. We'll be releasing you uh, two days, you know, uh, this afternoon. So a couple of days afterwards, it still wasn't having to go in the bathroom. I was like, all right, I'm just walking, eating, moving. And I was trying to keep low residue. I wasn't doing vegan or anything. I was just doing just kind of meats and vegetables, basically. And all of a sudden, like, I got so backed up. I was like, what the hell? And they're like, oh, all of your muscles in your lower intestine where we cut you open, they're spastic. They're seized up. So they had to give me injections to basically loosen up all the muscles. So that was one thing. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, I can, I'm not sure if you ever want to see this photo, but I developed this sort of get into this huge lump. So it was mainly laparoscopic. If you know laparoscopic surgery, it's mainly like small holes that they do for any kind of like orthopedic or internal surgeries, but they usually have one main incision. And that main, one of the main incision was a two inch kind of cut right below my belly button. And about a couple of weeks as, uh, after the surgery, I started developing this big lump. I was like, this is swollen. This is looking awkward. I think this is infected. This is kind of painful. And I went back to the surgeon, went back to the physician's assistant, uh, and they're like, well, you know, Mr. Brownland, it's just a hematoma, probably. Just stop worrying about you. Just worry. Just go home and live your life. And I was like, fine. I'll just pretend like nothing ever happened. And uh, went home, and a couple of days later, it, it swelled up to the size of a grapefruit. And my whole analogy was kind of like the movie Alien, where the alien pops out of the person's stomach back from, like, what was that, the 1980s? Yeah. It was humo It was so painful. I just couldn't move. And I, I was like, oh, God, this is a, this is a bad infection. That fucking bitch. She just told me not to worry about it. And it got worse. So I took some photos. I sent it over to the surgeon. He's like, get to the ER immediately. So they had to recut me open. And I, they did it without any anesthesia because they said, well, we're just going to cut you open. It's going to be mostly superficial. But I felt everything. And they had to drain all of the infection out and a lot of blood out. And then they said, we're not going to suture it back up because the infection is coming inside. We're going to leave this. We have to change the gauze three times a day. So keep this big kind of hole, like basically right below your belly button. You're just going to stick it with gauze, take it out. I had to do that for a couple of weeks. And then it got infected again. So they had to cut it back open. So two times after the original surgery, they had to recut me open. That's why I always say, yeah, I got cut open six ways from Sunday, right? So, and then it finally healed up and 
what I actually had to do uh, was I was just doing some long, long time fasting to kind of help me heal, but I was losing weight though. And so it was kind of like a double edged sword. And then the, finally the surgeon was saying like, you know, we should think you go back. You're still having complications. We talked and we think about kind of like, you know, removing more part of your intestine. I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. You guys just made me worse by covering my test. You said I was going to be a lot better. Now you're talking about cutting open and removing more of my intestine or all of my intestine. So I basically gave my middle fingers to the doctors and said, you know what, something is seriously wrong with me. I'm going to do some extensive blood work. And that's where I found I had Lyme disease and co-infections that were probably contributing to a lot of these problems. The stress and alcohol doesn't help, but I still believe to this day that a lot of the pharmaceutical bullshit that I was eating from, taken from these doctors were completely wrecked me and ruined my immune system. So um, I started doing some IV therapy, vitamin infusions, which started helping me feel better, glutathione, vitamins, high dose vitamin C. Uh, and then I started doing some ozone therapy, which I really still do to this day. I actually really promote ozone therapy because I think it's a great way for a lot of different conditions and, and almost is a great natural anti-inflammatory. And then, um, well, I was, I was going to ketogenic because I was like, you know what? I can't tolerate any carbs. This is my new... So I started get I started I was like okay can't even do any kind of sweet potatoes or regular potatoes or even like the simplest was like jasmine and white rice was like the simplest because there's no fiber it's very soothing no resin all that I was like nope I'm still I'm still like, getting issues so I started eliminating but then I started doing trial and error and I think I spoke with a couple of um, dietitians like just like you know co like health coaches but they're you know a functional nutritionist and they said well you may want to try out you know, that carnivore diet, that all meat diet, some people swear on, this was like in 2018, um, like about a year after the surgery. And I was like, okay, let me look into it. And that's when I spent, uh, spoke with Michaela Peterson. And I think this is shortly after she first started. And this was when, before she became a big podcaster. And she said, yeah, she's like, you know, this is, it's very simple. Look at, try to take less supplements. You don't want to take too many enzymes because your body will kind of rely on that to start producing enzymes. Um, so you just want to keep it simple. You're not going to use any plants or any plant oils. It's like no coconut oil, no, uh, you know, no avocado oil, even though it's supposed to be less inflammatory. They're still going to cause problems. You're just going to use tallow and lard for cooking and just eat mainly meats. Okay. And you, your body will adjust to it. And I started realizing a huge difference in the inflammation. And I wanted to dig a little deeper, um, and that's where I met with the paleo medicina clinic with uh, Dr. Sophia Clemens. And she was with, with Dr. Uh, Salva Toth at that time. I Skyped with them first. I realized how, you know, nice they are, like how intelligent they were when I kind of conversed with them on Skype, even with them, you know, they're still kind of like a translating thing from Hungarian. And I was like, you know what, I really want to kind of stay with you guys and just see what you guys, you know, you know basically um, stay at your clinic for about a week. And I want to get away from LA. So even though I was still kind of struggling with pains, I basically said, you know what, I don't give a shit. I'm going to fly all the way over to Hungary. And that's where like, I basically treated with them with a very, very high fat ketogenic diet. And that's where they, they actually do 80% fat usually. I mean, most of their plate is fat. And that's where you learn that fat meat, uh, fat from meat, from quality animals can heal. And I was amazed on how much better my gut was feeling by going to really high fat because ketogenics usually 70 percent they do like 80 to 90 percent and not just that yeah, that's, that's crazy <laughs> and not just that they're um uh one of the they said that we stayed at a hotel but right behind the hotel was like a farm and and they and one thing i learned about like uh hungry and they had someone from spain they said like the best meats in the world usually come from those places because they don't feed any corn or soy to their right yeah their much much better quality pork and chicken yeah yeah and there's some there's more and more farms that are coming up in uh, the united states and i'm very appreciative of that and i always try to promote like corn free and soy free um uh pork and poultry if you ever do because meat beef is your best quality because that's really good nutrient dense and it's got a better omega-3 to 6 ratio but that's the problem with i mean people when they think carnivore diet they're like oh you just eat anything meat and they're just eating like the crappy like conventional shitty chicken that you can get from any kind of grocery store i'm like no that's <laughs> real in the sale bin for two bucks yeah yeah exactly and i started realize, and i can totally tell the difference if i eat a, a shitty quality meat versus a quality kind of chicken and during the histamine season i'm like all right 
especially since I had the black mold exposure I told you about, I had the histamine issues come up. I'm like, all right, I need fresher meat. So I go from North Star Bison. And then they also have, when I eat a chicken, uh, any kind of a poultry, it's always corn-free and soy-free chicken. So after that, that started helping. And then last thing I've, I always recommend to just kind of get your life back um, for me uh, was I started learning about hyperbaric oxygen therapy because you may have heard this in the other video. I actually developed like a very serious skin disease and some call it a skin cancer, but uh, it's called pyoderma gangrenosum. So, you know, derma meaning skin, gangrenosum, such as gangrene, where when I was so inflamed after those, those, those back and forth surgeries, I started developing these ulcerations all over my body. And it started off with a bruise and then the bruise would start opening up and goozing and and basically it would start turning into a major infection where basically it start like ulcerated and would not heal non-healing wounds and i finally saw a doctor who was the former um dermatologist for the pga tour like the old golfers like uh, lee trevino and jack nicholas and all that went to him uh it took me a long time to get an appointment and he's like look at i study medicine and you're up in i'm gonna recommend something your insurance is not gonna cover it all right but it's gonna be the only thing to help and he recommended hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And after having these kind of ulcers all over my, I was wrapped up like, it wasn't getting on my face, but it was all over my limbs. And I, I kind of explained in the video, I had such a bad ulcer on my hip where I can put my finger inside the wound and touch my hip bone. It was that gruesome. It was so much pain. But after doing the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, a couple times a week for a couple of weeks, all the wounds I've had for like eight months completely healed. So yeah. So, and then I started pushing forward, but my main kind of goal now, even though I'm finishing off, I'm supposed to be a doctor by the end of the year. I'm already an attorney and I'm a dietetic technician, which is kind of like a registered dietitian. Except below that, I'm also a broker and, but I want to become a doctor, but not a medical doctor. I'm getting my PhD in public policy administration because I don't like how the governments function in so many different ways. And I think I want my voice to be heard at higher levels, especially with my experience with conventional medicine, I think that's something that needs to be changed. And I'm one of the few attorneys in LA County that was speaking out against the forced vaccine mandates and the forced mask mandates. Um, and I, they're going to try to do that again. I was like, oh, it already happened. I was like, no, they're going to keep doing a new bullshit variant every time. And um, I actually want to kind of get speak out against conventional medical, um, you know, wisdom as they want to call it, but basically uh, I call it the uh, Satanism. <laughs> I, I think it takes, you know, you, you have an incredible story and there's so many ways that I could relate to you. And we haven't really even gotten into the service component with you as well, but uh, which, which is mold toxicity. And, you know, I become, you know, you just become so disillusioned with the system. And when you start to learn about all this stuff, you start to learn about carnivore and you see the health benefits of it. It's like a gateway drug. Maybe I'm not, you know, maybe that's not the correct term for it, but it's a gateway to all this other stuff that really expands your way of thinking. Like you're, you've just been lifted outside of this box and you see the truth for what it is. And you start to realize that the medical system isn't looking out for your best interests. I mean, it's almost laughable to say that now. It's, it's always money driven and there's always some political agenda behind that. And, not, and like I, you saw from my other video, one of like, the person that I probably hate most in the world is Bill Gates. <laughs> and people, I'm surprised that people are like, oh, it's the, you know, it's the Bill Gates Foundation. He's doing it for all like, dude, he's got such a political agenda. Like I'm talking to, I, I loved how Dr. Shafee was talking about that, about like even blocking out the sun. Are you fucking kidding me? Blocking out the sun, you think that's going to save the world? All this, oh, well, it's global warming, but now it's too cold. So now it's climate change. And you got Greta Thunberg with that little blabby mouth and she's so full of shit. And it, I mean, it just- uh... Astro, astro, nuclear astrophysicist Greta Thunberg, or are we talking about the 13 year old who did, who's never even graduated? Yeah, the 13 year old that's getting like arrested for all these little, who, little who's ne- who's, political who has absolutely no credentials behind her name whatsoever. I don't know why no, people are taking taking science, you know, uh, advice from Greta Thunberg. But well, anyways, so, yeah, but the same analogy with Bill Gates. He's got no medical degree. He's got no degree whatsoever. He was only known for being a, like a computer. Um, look, at, he was he was the best known. I mean, and look at the guy. <laughs> well, not just that, but he's best known for developing computer viruses. What does that tell you, right? Yeah. And he already admitted to getting kickbacks from Pfizer and Moderna. I mean, it's so kind of obvious that he's trying to push that. And he already admitted that yeah, well, there could be some complications. And I have some close friends 
that got a lot of horrible complications um, from the vaccine. I am so glad I never got that because I already saw through the bullshit and I stayed away from it. And you know what? I couldn't even see my own family and they still kind of disparage me to this day because I refused to get vaccinated. And I didn't like wearing masks. I'm like, look at, I got healed by oxygen, hyperbaric oxygen. What the fuck do you think putting a mask on your face is doing? That's called hypercapnia. Basically, <laughs> you're bringing your own carbon dioxide. You're actually, so look at it's part the of my opposite, PhD, right? Yeah. yeah. Look at part of my PhD is I have to look up clinical trials every weekend. Okay. Because you're studying kind of like, you know, not only kind of public policy, but you're studying kind of like cause and effects basically. So, you know, I got it really into like, okay, what the da damage are these masks are causing? And one of them is basically as, um, you know, they found out in the elderly, look at dementia. A lot of people, that's something I do because I do probate and trust litigation. I do conservatorships. It's usually when people develop dementia. They found, a, there's a study that found that the excessive use of wearing masks in all these senior centers actually accelerated dementia. Yeah, because you're getting less oxygen to your brain. It's obvious. And not just that, you look like an idiot. You're wearing a mask outside you know, and you're right in the worst. Alone in your car with the windows down. <laughs> yeah. So my my analogy is that you're the, the people that are driving around with their own car in their own cars by themselves with a mask on, with latex gloves and shoe gatherings and a face shield. They're the same people that are probably sleeping by themselves in their own bed with a condom on. I mean, that's that's how dumb they become. So <laughs> no, that's why that's, I that's, like that's, that's why I get a lot of warnings from the court because I kind of speak out whenever they're like, you know, kind of bring it up like, oh, we're still practicing social distancing, Mr. Brown. I'm like, all right, so you're going to be putting a plexiglass in front of like every different person. Do you want me to go up to the uh, to the uh, to the bench in a bubble, Your Honor? That's what I meant. So I make like these kind of like offensive sarcastic. So, yeah. Six I got some people. warnings from so, the state bar. <laughs> you know, I'm 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 trying to rack my brain. You know, is it just a is it just a power and and money play? Like, why are why why are they up to these antics? Like, what 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 do you think is the reason is behind it? Well, there's always some kind of like change that they're trying to like kind of condone or kind of recommend, but it's I think it's like it's a cycle. Like every you know, there's all these kind of these questionable flus that come around, and. Yeah. I think it's some kind of money agenda behind it. I mean, look at, they want it. Well, another thing is you think these things coming up and I think it really plays a role in elections too. It's, it's. Oh, like, right. It's yeah. Little, you can't tell me that that didn't play a huge role in the last election, right? Exactly. It was complete, complete scare. And they wanted people to do more mail-in voting and not go into like the, you know, and that's where all the voting fraud came apart and it's happening again. They're like, Oh, we're having a new variant. Oh, that's right. Elections are coming up. Yeah. That figures. So it's, and I, you know, I'm not going to try to bring in too many politics because the main thing is about health, but I do, do think politics play a huge role in the way uh, conventional medicine is trying to basically kill us um, because yeah. there's always some kind of tactics behind it. And sorry, the Demo Democratic Party is really playing a bad role in this with, with what they're trying to do with their agenda. And look at what is the Democratic Party also trying to promote? They're trying to promote plant-based diets. Hey guys, let's all eat bugs. Stop eating meat. Meat is killing us. Cow farts are really causing climate change. I'm like, this is the stupidest things I've ever heard. But anyways, yeah, I, I, I that's one thing I like. I you know I'm not very political. I I uh, I, I don't want to say who I'm supporting. I can't even vote here anyway because I'm you know I I'm not I'm not even a citizen yet. But, um, you know, RFK has been talking a lot about regenerative agriculture. He's really the only one who talks about it and talking about, you know, the, the benefits of meat and stuff like that. So I think that's pretty cool that, that, you know, it is getting a little bit political in terms of like, you know, shifting a little bit to the other side because it's so plant based. Right. Everything you hear from politicians yeah. is plant based. And and so most politicians, you know, on the right just don't even talk about it. It's not really something they mention. So I can tell you in Canada, they were actually trying to put labels. I think that they were trying to do that here, too. They're trying to put labels on red meat saying, warning, there's a saturated fat in this and saturated Yeah, they don't put anything on the, like, the sugar laden products. And they're actually recommending, like, I think someone posted, like, some um, memes saying, like, well, actually, it was, it was a photo at the grocery store. We had like all these like sugar sweet selection and like they had like a, like a, a go heart healthy kind of sticker from the AND, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Like sugar is actually not the cause of diabetes. I'm like, yeah, I can, but can you imagine, food. can you imagine going in the grocery store and you're passing by the meat aisle and all the red meat has a warning label on it. And yet you're going by, let's say the seed oil aisle and you see all this corn and, and canola oil and all this toxic soup. 
has a heart health check on it. No yeah. trend, no, tr you know, no saturated fat. Like, I mean, it's just so corrupt. It's so backwards, you know? And that's where I learned that, you know, quality uh, animal fats can heal. And that's where you get the good saturated fats. And yeah. People don't realize the benefits behind it. It's just all the conventional bullshit. And I think I may explain, like, I actually, even after past the bar exam, I, well, I love further education. They call me a study nerd, even though I used to be a party holic, but I went through like the, you know, my clinical rotations to become a dietetic technician. And I hated everything I freaking learned. And that's someone I wanted to speak against it. And when I, before I got my MBA, I was like, eh, I want to get my master's, but you know, since I, my program, I was supposed to become a full on registered dietitian, but I couldn't get any clinical rotations um, uh, here in California because I was doing distance learning through Rutgers. So I was like, Hey, well, you know what? USC has got a master's in uh, dietetics program. Let me kind of go through that. And I, and they said, yeah, you got all the prerequisites. You got an extensive background. You're already an attorney and you got a, you know, you got a postgraduate degree. So, so what can you bring us? And this is, I explained this on a separate video with Dr. Shafee is the, it's kind of, it's kind of amazed if you look at like all these kind of health and like nutrition, and like dietetic and like, you know, companies and like their board of directors and I, they look like a bunch of fat pigeons. And I was, it was, it was the best explanation. I had like four or four or five ladies that are surrounding me for the interview they're all overweight. They got like, like these chicken legs and these little pot bellies. They look disgusting. And my, it looked like Whoopi Goldberg, Joy, Joy Boy, Bihar, or whatever, and like the rest of the view just surrounding me. And they're like, well, wh what do you think you can do for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics? And how could you change those? And then I completely said, no, I think you ladies need to consider flipping the food pyramid upside down. And <laughs> I was like, this is based on everything I've learned and personally experienced. And they all said, well, we don't think you're a better fit. And that's where I was like, good. You know what? That's best because I don't want to be part of this shit if you want me to kind of promote your kind of agenda. So I, I do believe there's a lot of changes that need to be made. And I spoke with Dr. Shafee is I was doing my clinical rotations. One of them was working with um, uh, providing uh, food for schools. And you'd be amazed on all the crap they were feeding these kids nowadays. Oh, yes. I have a two year old and five year old and it, it's disgusting. It's just Cheez-Its and goldfish and, and just absolute crap. It's yeah. something I've been talking to the school about, but they they won't budge on it. You know, yeah, no, you and they're at actually the, trying to take food. meat away from all of like the school, like uh, the, the, the the schools, like dietary like guidelines, too. It's it's all their, their, their school lunch programs. It's it's amazing. They're Look, okay, it's so obvious that we're becoming so overweight and like, you know, you know, diabetes is on the rise and heart disease is on the rise, not just not because of meat. That's the stupidest analogy. And yeah. the, whole, the whole kind of like theory that cholesterol is the problem. Like, no, you actually we do need cholesterol. Well, we, we've been eating meat since the beginning of time. Why didn't we have all this heart disease and all these other problems before? Like, it's yeah. ridiculous. I mean, you could look at populations like Hong Kong with the highest meat per, uh, consumption per capita. You know, and they don't have nearly the uh, the rate of obesity and heart disease and diabetes and stuff that we have here in America. So, yeah. it's and so I'm really afraid of our new generation. I don't have any kids, not only because I'm still kind of managing everything after the surgery, but I also I'd be a horrible husband and father. I'm I'm usually traveling. I'm working excessively. I'm in school 24 seven. So I never be really home for a wife and kids. But, you know, um, I'm really concerned about my nephews because all the BS they are going through those schools and my family really doesn't like me speaking out and they're against me eating an all meat diet. I'm just, so that's why I'm kind of glad I have the carnivore community. I'm really, I'm actually very fortunate that there's a lot of support members, such as your yeah. group. I'm really I'm glad you guys, I, I still apologize to my friend, Emily, for not joining meat stock this year, but being Emily Penn, yeah, I love yeah. her. Uh, you know, and she was kind of like bragging about all her beautiful photos over here at the cabin. And I was like, all right, I'm finishing my PhD. And I, kind of had some back and forth trials and I was doing starting my dissertation process right now. So I really don't have the time for traveling and probably like do, spending night. I, unfortunately I need to pay off my tuition. I need to work and uh, I need to some settle to some things, but I would love to be able to come next year. That'd be awesome. So I'm glad that you, the carnivore community is expanding. And one thing I've also learned about the carnivore community is very supportive. So, and like a lot of, there's a lot of people that have, they've had, not the, the same exact experience as mine. Um, I was actually supposed to move, lose all my intestines. I just fought back by, first of all, I did an extensive fast. I, I do recommend fasting to a good extent. Fasting we were, has saved my life. Yeah. What, yeah. What kind I of actually, fasting do you do? 
uh, you know, I usually do the intermittent fasting throughout the day. And then the late afternoon, I'll go into like a, you know, um, spend like a, probably an hour eating like a slow, heavy, like meat based meal. So we're talking uh, like 23 hours a day kind of thing. You do like, oh, yeah, I would say, yeah, exactly. And then sometimes if I need to gain, I'm still getting a little bit of weight. So sometimes I'll go to two, you know, like a meal in the afternoon, a meal in the early evening and do like a kind of a lesser kind of like, you know, you know change my window. Um, but sometimes I'll do extensive, like a one or two day fast. But, um, but one thing I've been learning practicing lately is dry fasting. Yeah. I gotta be very careful. got to make sure you have like, like a weekend where you really lay low and don't do anything because you really don't want to exert yourself. But Asa Santiago is uh, part of the carnivore community. He's become like an expert on it. And, I know him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, we're before. mutual colleagues. I actually helped him out with a few things too. So, um, uh, but yeah, um, we always talk about like one of the things uh, like, uh, from the fasting, but, but not just that, you know, there's not too much clinical studies behind it. Uh, I wish there was, I think there should be more money spent on some doing some clinical studies of dry fasting, but it's amazing on some people like, yeah, there's one guy talking about like how he had really severe colon cancer. Cause I had, I had stage two. Mine wasn't like extensive. That was part of like the reason for the insur- surgery, but um, he actually like basically um, avoided any chemotherapy or any kind of re- further like a treatment for colon cancer by just doing, he was actually doing dry fasting intermittently with eating raw meat. That's, you know, that actually sounds promising because when it comes to like beef, actually, I, sometimes I actually feel better eating it raw than eating it cooked. And in fact, I think overcooked meat is horrible. I only cook the meat really well if it's fucking poultry, <laughs> poultry or pork usually. So I, I don't think I have the balls to eat that raw yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be- well, yeah. I'm I'm curious about dry fasting. I've been I've been doing fast myself. I typically, you know, my typical fast might be like 24, 36, 36 hours. I mean, I'm so thin that I can't really do these. Like I, I've heard of these crazy stories of people doing two, three, four week fasts, and I'm just like, there's there's no way. I would just I did ten days was my longest, but that was after. But that was basically to heal up and prevent them from cutting me open any further. Because right after I gave the middle finger to the doctor after it sealed up, I was afraid that I was going to come back again. So yeah. You know, that's just like, you know, Dr. Mercola and a couple of other doctors really promote. It's like, you know what? It's one of the most, the best and cheapest ways of healing yourself. But then again, you have to combat of like how well nourished you are. Cause that's why I usually don't do a fast until you're really kind of nourished yeah. and kind of fed. And that's, so right now, as I told you earlier, that I had a really bad mold exposure. I'm still getting the mold out of my system last year, but that took me out of commission for like four or five months. And I lost like 20, 20 25 pounds. I'm slowly getting it back. Wow. That, so what, what happened then? Like, let's, could you mind if we just dive into that for a few minutes? Like what, what happened? Like what symptoms you know were what? you getting? It was just, like, just what, constant what was exposure on? because I didn't realize that this condominium that I, I bought, it wasn't really within the condo itself, but it was within the walls, but also it was all in the common areas. And I was constantly walking around the common areas, but they had such thick carpet at every time. So I was going in and out because I don't like just staying in my place all day. So every time I'm going in, I started breathing it, but I just got so cumulative over a while. I just like, I just started breathing really heavy and I started getting nauseous and I started throwing up. And then I didn't realize I was so sensitive and highly allergic to mold. I started throwing up blood and it got so inflamed. And then, you know, this, that scar tissue where they cut me open is always going to be a sensitive spot. And I'm always going to remember it. And it's still, I still have, the scar tissue built up where I have to like do some manual manipulation and try some um, shockwave ultrasound therapy. And uh, I do also laser therapy around that area because that part where they cut me open, those muscles always tend to tighten up excessively because of all the scar tissue. I'm actually going to see uh, another carnivore doctor, as I told you, Dr. Solt uh, over in Arizona to see how she can like, you know, possibly use stem cells for, um, for the scar tissue. But anyways, um, when I was getting really bad with a mold, yeah, even just eating all meat, and Michaela explained too, like even if you're eating an all meat based diet, if you're basically breathing in mold, everything that you breathe goes right into your gut. So it doesn't matter if you're eating on the cleanest diet, if you're breathing in mold every day, and not just that, you absorb it through your skin. So even if you're not breathing with a, I don't know, fucking N95 yeah. mask or something like that. So yeah, it, it started ruining, and I started having so much lower intestinal pain because right when it got to that surgical area where all the nerves are really tight, that's where it, it was causing a lot of pain. So, um, and then I did like the, the worst thing I was like, I was getting so low on weight where I was like, shit, I need something really easy to di- digest. 
I need to gain weight because I'm getting so malnourished. I started adding in white rice, but then it didn't really help because it was just feeding the fungus. Um, so luckily I got out of there. Um, and I finally found like a temporary place where I'm actually staying. I'm actually staying in a luxury apartment right now. Um, but I still, I still own properties, but, um, I'm waiting for the interest rates to go back down so I can pop up another property and probably sell it or do a flip or something like that. But my, your environment is complete. And also we had a huge plumbing leak, not in right in the office, but like in the kitchen area, because the, um, in our office building, the office above us had a plumbing leak. And basically that caused all the mold in the back of the kitchen in the copy room. So every time I was going back in there, I was like, in Nasha. So not only was I getting sick at home, but I was getting sick at work. And and if you know, mold spores are kind of everywhere, if, especially if you live in a very humid area. In LA County, the humidity is between 70 to 80 to 85% on a regular basis. That's why I go out to the desert on the weekends. I've got a property in, de in the desert. I usually Airbnb it, but I go out there on the weekends when it's free because I love getting away from LA because I love getting away from all the assholes here in LA. But I love... The fact that I go to a dry area, I don't have to worry about mold. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, I, I always I always feel better when I go to the desert on the weekends. It's amazing, and not just that; it's a blessing. You get better scenery because it's it's not just like dry desert where you have nothing but cactus. I just go out there where there's usually the mountains, past past like Palm Springs, like the Palm Desert area. So um, yeah, dealing with the mold is something kind of um, that you can't really fix on a meat-based diet alone. You need to kind of detox out of your system. So I'm doing infrared saunas every week. Uh, I usually do contrast therapy. I'll do an infrared sauna. And then right afterwards, I'll do cryotherapy right after I get out of the sauna, just to kind of keep the inflammation down. Dry fasting, I still incorporate that maybe once a month or once every two months. How long do you do the dry fast for? Is it like 24 hours or what do you do? Uh, the last time I did 40, um, I'm going to see if I can push to 48 this weekend. <laughs> we'll see we'll see what it comes out though but i'm still but it kind of sucks is like i don't want to do it too extensive because i'm still trying to gain weight at the same time i still probably have another i think i just to get like to feel a level of comfort probably another five or ten pounds i want to feel so i'm gaining right. slowly back up to that uh, bad mold exposure right okay wow well that's like the crazy story man crazy you've had a lot of shit to deal with but it sounds to me like carnivore helped you to great extent but now you have you're still dealing with some of the sur stuff and you're seeking treatment for that now yeah that's something that you know you got to be very careful because i think even when you're uh your colleague jc even mentioned when she was talking with me is that um you know certain binders can like really irritate your gut you gotta be oh yeah careful. it can make it way worse oh yeah i don't tolerate all this like uh, you can be very well, because some some binders it just makes the toxins recirculate through your system it doesn't actually remove it yeah. I know there's like for for SIRS mold toxicity, there's certain binders that you have to take. There's those like uh, cholesterol. Yeah, based on right? yeah, it's based on what type of mycotoxins that you have. Yeah. So that's why they say like activated charcoal and zeolite will treat some. Probiotics actually treat others. Uh, bentonite clay will treat others. Um, citrus pectin will treat others. So yeah, but but you know what? I just it's, I got to make make sure I can manage myself because after I get my um, PhD, I. I think I mentioned in the last video that I do plan on running for Congress in the next couple of years. I want to change some things around. I already get some random threat, uh, threats when I speak out against the force of vaccines and the force mandates. And you get these masked Nazis that will say, you're going to die and you're going to come because you're not wearing a mask. And I'm actually getting those threats on a weekly basis because I post on LinkedIn, but I want the voice to be heard at higher levels. I don't like what they're doing to our kids. Um, I don't like what they're uh, feeding with the schools. I don't like the fact that they're trying to shut down the meat industry. I don't like the fact they're shutting down the farms. I do believe in regenerative farming. And one, you may have a mutual colleague uh, as well, Nidhi Bali. Uh, she calls herself like the, the pharmacist, but she's all about regenerative farming and a meat-based diet. So I'll kind of reach out to her, but she's basically explains on how we can kind of help out the ecosystem with regenerative farming. It's the complete opposite of what the government's telling you about cow farts causing problems. And so this thing's so a lot of need to, yeah. So before they try to, um, you know, turn everybody into eating bugs and plant-based chemicals, I'm not sure if you ever looked at the ingredients of a impossible burger or some other kind of plant-based burger. Or shit, just egg. <laughs> well, yeah, well, exactly. It's so many ingredients. Like you know, every food, whether you know what, whether a vegetarian or a meat eater or a herbivore or anything else like that, 
your food should have one ingredient. That's a very simple thing. Okay. Yeah. It shouldn't have natural flavorings because you'll see meat at the grocery store with natural flavorings. Isn't that crazy? I didn't even know that existed. And they actually, I saw meat with coloring. There was red, red dye 40. And, and, and this was at um, Winn-Dixie. And I looked at the bottom of the barrel sale counter and there was a, a, a ground beef with red dye 40, if you could believe that. I've yeah. never seen that before. Yeah, no, that's, that's, it's, it seems like, you know, it's impossible to get like some food nowadays with no, like just one ingredient. It's, it's yeah. unbearable. So there's things well, that you can find, change. you just have to find a good farmer, you know, that's yeah, all. exactly. And that's why I usually post a lot on LinkedIn. That's where people can usually find me. I'm always posting on, Hey, support your local farmers. You know, uh, yeah. basically you want to get some quality meats. Uh, there is a couple of farms that are, I like North star bison because they promote a lot of low histamine meats, especially yeah. with battling with the mold. They actually have some of the freshest meats. They have fresh bison, fresh uh, yeah. venison, and all their poultry and pork are corn-free and soy-free. I just got a shipment in today, and actually I'm trying to like, you know, um, trying to mixture of like, you know, um, dark and white meats. So I got turkey and I got venison. So well, I'm going to give a shout out to my farmers, Lick Skillet Farm in Tennessee and uh, our ancestors foods here in Florida. And they're both low histamine as well. They don't, uh, they don't age Good. any of their meats they freeze it right away no corn no soy no no bullshit so oh yeah. I, I love that it's a good motto too so and you know what that's that's one thing that's hard to find because a lot of people they actually feel sometimes a little worse by eating a grass-fed versus conventional I'm like usually it's because they age grass-fed meats and that's where people need to realize that you need to be yeah. very selective of your grass-fed meats so you're probably yeah because they usually age for to make it tender and to make it taste but for a lot yeah, yeah, it's hard people, to find some, on beef. yeah exactly so a lot of people like just prefer very tender beef and they prefer to taste a lot and like but these are the same people that probably had like steak sauce and a lot of other crops yeah. for their meats and stuff like that i was like i don't have any seasonings the only thing i usually kind of add a little bit if necessary is some like celtic sea salt or something like yeah. that you get a really bad histamine intolerance as well uh, yeah, well, I'm still battling the histamines, but um, I, you know, if I stay away from mold for a long time ago, like I think from 2020, 20 to, uh, 2020 to 2021, wasn't having any kind of mold and I was feeling amazing. So I can probably eat a lot of aged and beef and probably even a raw aged beef. But um, no, now if I eat you know, like an aged beef, I feel like shit. I mean, my eyes will get swollen. And I feel like lethargic. I'm like, ah, it just feels just like this, I don't know, nauseous, but just kind of feel like yeah, Out of it. kind of like yeah it, feel, it feels like just... i get the nausea i also get this weird thing now where it's like my muscles stop working like my legs feel like they're like lead weights like they just it's really weird you it know sucks. what mold exposure has so many different symptoms that it causes it's uh, that's how i'm still studying it and i'm learning how kind of do everything that i can around the office and i have to have like some air better air purifiers i, I even switched my carpet in my office compared to the rest of the office to make it the thinnest carpet as possible yeah because the thicker carpets are usually the huge culprit because it absorbs all the toxins and moisture well hey man um that's that's an incredible story i i hope you keep sharing it i'd love to get you back on the channel too and uh you know maybe we could get a little bit more into politics it sounds like you and i are kind of you know, yeah, I, I know you share a lot of the same opinions on politics and certain things. So that might be kind of a fun conversation, a, da a dangerous conversation. It is. And you about. know what? Yeah. One of my colleagues is actually becoming a judge and he is another, I went to high school with him. And then I remember I had a post with him on LinkedIn because we were both went to our, like our high school career day. And I was like, Hey, you know what? This is because, uh, you know, St. John Bosco, we promote, like, you know, we teach people how to be real men, not all this, uh, <laughs> kind of went off about like you know what they're teaching like uh, in the schools about transgender like you know drag shows and he's like hey guy he's like hey i need you to take my name out of that post man i'm, I'm about to become a judge and i can't be affiliated with any kind of political remarks <laughs> i was like you know what i actually it's all right i don't plan on running for judging even if i ever run for a, salt, a seat in the house or the senate i'm not gonna have anybody tell me what i can or cannot say so i'm always there for yeah. so i think the main kind of point of this and I uh, discussed that I really want others to think twice. If you're really sick, if you're really struggling, please think twice before going to any conventional doctor. And you'll never hear a doctor tell the patient, my goal is for you to never see me again. And that's there for a reason. They yeah. want a repeat customer. So I really am glad that I kind of found the carnivore diet in other ways, of uh, modalities to heal myself. Yeah. 
You know, it's it's sad. I, I, I really do think that a lot of doctors have good intentions. It's just the medical system has set them up for that belief Yeah, system. it, it, it And, brainwashed. and the pharmaceutical companies definitely want repeat customers. I mean, that's their whole business model is based on that, right? So Yeah, a customer it's... it's cured, as we, a patient cured is a customer lost, right? Isn't that the same? Yeah, I, I think that a lot of doctors I talk to, they are good people. It's just that they, you know, it's just the, the medical system has set them up for that belief system of that, you know, that they're doing a good thing. And, uh, you know, Our, our some family of them doctor, are. So some our family doctors doctor is are the because. same. Our family doctor is the same uh, analogy is because Yeah. I can tell he's a good loving guy. He's a family. He really tries to help them. But whenever you try to mention like they got some reason, oh, I think there's a medication that fixes that. And like everything, even like if it's a nail to the back of someone's head, they always think of what kind of pill would fix that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's a lot of good doctors. There's Dr. Kiltz, uh, you know, just on our retreat, we had Dr. Kiltz, Oh no, Dr. yeah, and you know what? Dr. I'm gonna Baker say that is Dr. not practicing, Kiltz, yeah, they're Dr. Veda. they're not convention they're not conventional doctors in my eyes. Yeah. I'm, conventional is ones that are sticking to pharmaceuticals. And I, in fact I, I love and I admire uh, Baker, Shafee, Barry, uh Kiltz, and uh, a lot of other ones too, is because Yeah. they're really teaching us that it's like, hey, don't take medication. Natural all meat diet can actually heal a lot of different symptoms, and there's Yeah. millions of people speaking out about it now. So I'm glad Well, that it, it takes a lot of courage. And I think it takes a lot of courage as like, especially you being a lawyer in California to be speaking about the things you're speaking about. So uh, kudos to you guys and kudos to those doctors in the carnivore community for, for really sort of helping buck the system a little bit, but um, Hey man, thanks. Thanks again for coming on. And, uh, and uh, do you have any information you want to share? Is there anywhere we could uh, follow you or do you want to, I'm, I'm primarily on LinkedIn, but you can always find my website, brandlinlaw.com. Um, I'm always available. And I actually, after my last video, I always tell people I'm, you know, I'm licensed in two States, but I can still kind of do some limited, like, you know, work in others. And I still have the general knowledge is that I actually kind of make myself kind of available for the carnivore community. You know, if you guys have any legal questions or problems and unfortunately I always tell people, my goal is for you to never need an attorney, but Unfortunately, the law is almost inevitable. I think almost every person's going to need an attorney at some point in their life, especially. Oh, yeah. And I do Yeah. estate planning too. So it's non litigation based, like I mean, even if there's no disputes, it's basically setting up your living trust before you pass away, especially if you own real property. Yeah, it's funny how I, I never seem to uh, need a lawyer <laughs> until until the last year, especially going through divorce. And now, uh, you know, there is a, a particular person uh, who I may have to, uh, to deal with. So, yes. Uh, yeah. It's funny how it's all hitting me in one year. It kind of sucks, but I guess it's inevitable. It has to happen, right? So anyway, thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate it, man. Uh, thanks for sharing your story. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get you back on. All right. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Scott.